Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, and here we explore life, death, consciousness, and what it all means. The Divine CEO is a no-nonsense pragmatic book about the hierarchy of spiritual ascent. It comes from the pen of acclaimed writer Jeff Thompson, former bouncer, world-ranking martial arts guru, and BAFTA-winning screenwriter. This is a master class on how to con- contract your ego, expand your conscious awareness, and build a powerful internal hierarchy through mastery of mind, body, and senses. For anyone looking to break their negative associations with the world and create a divine covenant with their greatest potential, their own internal chief executive officer, this empirical, muscular, and direct study of spiritual ascension is the perfect companion. It is the essence of the author's 50-year apprenticeship in practical spirituality and high-end Budo martial arts. Welcome, Jeff, to the show today. A few things to talk about before we get started with today's episode. If you have not subscribed to my newsletter yet, I have some exciting things coming out in the next weeks, months, unclear how long it's going to take me to get it together, but there will be some stuff coming out and I don't want you to miss it. So head on over to dramyrobbins.com and subscribe to my newsletter. And I also wanted to tell everybody about an amazing opportunity with IANS. IANS is the International Association for Near Death Studies, and their 2020 conference is online. This year's theme is Unlocking the Healing Wisdom of NDEs, and the program is packed to the brim with fantastic speakers and experts to guide newcomers and seasoned experiencers alike through the mysterious worlds of near-death experiences, spirits, and the afterlife. This conference, again, is online via Zoom, August 14th to 16th, and you can visit IANS.org for more info. That is I-A-N-D-S. And many of the speakers who have been on this show in the past are also members of IANS. It's an amazing organization that really promotes the work, so much of the work that I'm doing on this show in terms of bringing to light many people's spiritual experiences and spiritually transformative experiences. So head on over and check that out. And now to today's show. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. So let's just dig right in here and talk about what consciousness means to you and sort of what you've discovered in your 50-year apprenticeship in studying spirituality. Consciousness to me is something that's always there. It's the only constant. And as we contract the ego, our availability to consciousness opens up. So we're able to see more and more of what is always there. So like eschatology, everything is already there. Um, I think the Buddhists call it the clear view. As we are able to reclaim parts of ourself that have been stolen, that we've been lost to the ego, we're able to fill that with consciousness or awareness and just get a wider, clearer view of what is already right in front of us. So consciousness is our inheritance it's, and it's constant. And how do you define the ego and how do you define contracting the ego? How do we do that? I, I, I would see the ego in esoteric terms as the animal soul, but the higher soul, the animal soul, the ego gets taken over by perceptions, cognitions, perceptions, beliefs, uh, conceptualizations, um, and it has all of these um, projected opinions on the world. Um, And when we wake up, you know, people talk about being woke. When we wake up, we recognize that the ego is a lower, is the animal soul, the lower soul. And we realize that we are awake. We are the only one looking out of these eyes. But we also realize that we're not in charge. It's like, um, you know, it's like we've come back to our kingdom, but nobody recognizes us. We're not sovereign. We haven't got control over our basic habits, over our basic impulses. We don't know who we are. We, well, we wake up so we know who we are, but we know that there's lots of elements that we've been in covenant with that are not us. So the battle then becomes to win the self back or win the lower ego back. As the lower ego contracts, 
by getting rid of all the things that aren't soul or higher soul. As it contracts, consciousness expands. As, it, as consciousness expands, ego contracts. I call this uh, expansion through contraction, contraction through expansion. I spoke to Yuri Geller, you know Yuri Geller? Mm -mm. I, uh, he's, a, he's kind of a very famous mystic, the guy that bends spoons. Oh, okay. Yes, he's, uh, I spoke to him one day on the phone. He's a friend of a friend. And I said to him, Yuri, this was some years ago, how can I improve? He said, Jeff, you need to expand. And then one day I was talking to Gandhi in a, in a prepared meditation. I accessed Gandhi and I said, uh, Mahatma, how can I improve? He said, you need to make yourself small. They're both saying the same thing. The ego needs to be made small in order to make room for us to reveal consciousness. The consciousness needs to expand in order to take up the room of the ego. So we, we expand the consciousness when we do things like meditation. That's a compound exercise. It's the one thing people think it's socks and sandals. They think it's dream catcher, you know, sitting down and saying, oh, they don't think it's muscular. But that's a house ghost. It's very, very powerful. So the way to contract the, to, to contract the um, consciousness is to meditate seated meditation, Con and obviously uh, the more consistent we are, the more the compound works. The way to contract the ego is through an exercise, um, the esoterics in Christianity would call it apophatic theology, or uh, the way of finding God through negation, or the way of finding the self through negation. So nobody can really identify what God is or what the deity is, but they can tell you what it's not. I know, I know that my best self isn't jealousy, it isn't anger, it isn't rage or envy, it isn't greed, it isn't judgment, it's none of those things. So once I recognize that that definitely isn't who I am, that isn't coming from an authentic place, and I can start, I can begin um, no longer engaging those aspects of myself. So I'm stopping, when, when uh, jealousy rises up, I don't engage it. Reality exists at the level of engagement. So if we're able to uh. observe our thoughts and not connect to the thoughts, not engage with them or not identify with them, and we stop feeding them, eventually this semi-autonomous thought forms will dissipate. The essence that's locked in them, the effulgence, will come over to us and we'll get more consciousness. Um, and the nature of the addiction or the habit or the basic impulse will be liberated. So we start by, by looking at what we know we're not. It takes a lot of self-honesty. I have to be very honest with yourself and look in the mirror and go, yeah, I'm four stone overweight, so I can't call myself a master. It's no good me trying to learn to fly while I still can't even work my magic on this physical body. So it's saying, let's get control of the physical body. And that's how we contract the ego. We, mostly, if you wanted to reduce it even more, be kind. Be mm. kind. And even if you have to fake it for a little bit, be kind. Start with the external stuff. Be kind in everything you do. If it isn't kind, don't do it. Kindness doesn't mean letting people walk all over you. It doesn't mean not having your say. It just means coming from a place of kindness. Even if that kindness has to be tinged with a little bit of severity or a bit of judgment, everything's got to come from a congruent, kind place. So I we think that's... Sorry, Karen. No, I was just gonna. God, you said so much there. I don't. I, I want to like. I want to, you know, <laughs> dig into each piece of it. First, sort of reiterating that reality exists at the level of engagement, which is so powerful, right? It's like yeah. if we don't engage with whatever it is we're sort of thinking, then that doesn't become our reality, right? That's very true. Everything is everything is a conceptualization. The, the, the energy around us is neutral until we conceptualize it. If we conceptualize it, we give it a form. If it has a form, it has an aspect. So if I conceptualize you as um, aggressive, your form becomes an aggressor, um, and I become threatened as the aspect. So if I'm able to um, mm. take away denotation, take away concept, what I'm left with is just a neutral energy. If I don't engage that concept, obviously the world hypnotizes us, and we're mostly in a hypnagogic state, especially when we're watching things television and reading magazines, if we take in the, the conceptualizations of the world and create the forms the world is inviting us to take and those aspects, we will always have enemies. 
I have no enemies. I have no enemies at all. There's a lovely line in the Bhagavad Gita. Lift the self by the self. Never let the self droop down. The self is the self's only enemy. The self is the self's only friend. So we can, we can deconstruct. We can just say, this is a neutral energy. I'm going to challenge those concepts. I'm going to make them qualify themselves. And I'm going to neutralize this energy. And I'm going to, if I take it in at all, I'm going to make something beautiful from it. It's a, it takes a tremendous balance because before you can do that, of course, you need to know who you are. And we only know who we are when we wake up. <clears throat> and when we wake up, we are automatically aware that we are at war because there's a lower nature and a higher nature. Um, and they battle with each other. This is what the, uh, the, in Islam they would call it the greater jihad. The greater battle is the internal war. The, the external war is the lesser jihad. So we, we go to war with the elements of ourself, um, the semi-autonomous thought forms that we've given home to, <clears throat> And we subjugate them. So we get, we basically get control of the body, mind, um, and spirit so that we have a, we have a congruence. So my thinking, my saying, and my doing are in alignment. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, the, the, the long process is through meditation. It's, it's compound. It takes longer, but it's very solid. The short process is when we start to monitor our, our activities in the world, what we eat, what we drink. Uh, who we speak to, you know, what, um, whether we gossip or not, how, how kind we are, whether we're rationalizing our judgments um, and, and thinking that their own cat, you know, everyone's got an opinion about everything, but most of it is laced with judgment. So as, as you probably have been aware, that most of the world at the moment is feeding off negative energy. Yeah. So, that, <laughs> so what, what I'm saying is that that's a choice. If I don't engage the negative energy, I don't give it life. So if it rises up and the engagement point is here, this is the it's geographical, there's a place, it's here. In it's your right in here. your like throat chakra. Yeah, in this little in the little in the little dent here. Just okay. between, there. So if you have if you ever have a rush of passions, this is something to observe. If you ever have a big rush of passions, they might come in from all angles. They might come in they might come in through any of the senses. They might arrive in the soles of your feet as adrenaline. But before they before they have life, they have to be engaged. And the level of engagement here is here. So this is the doorway to the heart. This is the, when we're talking about the heart as the will. So if I engage these negative elements and they take over my will, I am incarnated into the nature of whatever it is I've engaged. So if I've engaged jealousy or anger or rage, but the time that I've engaged it, I am incarnated into that emotion. It takes over the driving seat. It acts through me. It thinks it's me. I think it's me, but it's not. It's a semi-autonomous thought form. And I act in the world. And of course, for the time I'm incarnated into that personality, whether that's five minutes or five years, I am creating karma in the world. I'm creating reciprocity. I'm creating, I'm creating causation. And at some point, if I wake up and come back to my normal everyday caretaker self, that part of me has to pick up the tab. You know, like the lovely story of Jekyll and Hyde. Um, Jekyll is, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Hyde is always having to pick up the bills for, for, for Mr. Jekyll. The two sides of the same person. So can, two you sides, you know. can you speak a little about your concept of sort of the worldview, your worldview. And I think you've started to allude to that a little bit. But yeah. in this day when it feels like so much needs to be changed, so many things need to be different, yeah. how do you sort of, I guess, use reality that or or sort of how do you shift your worldview away from this negativity to kind of what is and how is what is not negative, I guess? Yeah, well, for me, I'm not trying to change the world. I don't feel as though the world is asking me to change it. The world is whack-a-mole. It's, a, it's like a huge <laughs> game. If we push a problem down here, it will rise again there. That's if one of my favorite there, images. I use it all the time with my <laughs> therapy pa- in, in therapy with patients. Like if you whack yeah. one symptom down, another one's going to whack up if you don't. And they come back up, yeah. Yeah. So well, I used to work uh, – I used to – work in the skill center. I wanted to be a bricklayer. So in this skill center, they, they, um, they got us working on uh, 
building walls with, uh, to practice going onto the site. But we weren't, we were using real bricks, but we weren't using real cement. Nothing ever set, it just set enough to keep the wall up. So we would lay bricks and develop our skills. But at the end of the day, we'd take the wall down and start again. And then once we got our skills high enough, we'd go into the world. So, so the skill center is, is, is almost representative of the world. We are building things um, and we are trying to change things in the world, but it's not going to make any difference because the world isn't there to be changed. We're, we're here to be changed by using the world as, a, as a, an anti-gravity tool or as a resistance tool. So we perfect the soul um, by exercising it within this world, which will always have problems because that's why we're here. That's why Gandhi said it's very, very important that you do the best you can do, but it won't change anything. It used to confuse me. But what I understood was that the world, will, the, the world is ephemeral. It's going to build up. It's going to come down. All legacies will go. All buildings will disappear over time and space. The problems we had 50 years ago have reappeared with a different name today. So what, what I did in the skill center is I learned to build a wall, and, but I knew every day it would be taken down again. So I was just using the tools and the bricks and the mortar to develop skills. When I went out into the world, I was still aware that when I was building walls in a real place, the pressure was more because if, a, if the wall wasn't right, I wouldn't get paid. And if the wall wasn't right, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't have a job. So I was aware that there was more pressure, so there was, uh, there was more tension, so I was able to develop my inner soul even, even stronger, perfect it even stronger. But I was still aware that that wall over, over time and space would still come down. Every construction will eventually crumble. So nothing in the world is, nothing in the world is permanent. So I'm not looking for permanency in the world. I'm not looking for certainty in the world. But it is a good mirror for me. If I'm able to look out into the world and see the things that affect me emotionally, the things that affect me personally, especially if I'm projecting onto the world, you know, if I, if, especially if I've got a very strong opinion about the world, then it's normally a reflection of what I need to work on in me. So if I want to look at how I'm doing in my world, I just need to look around me and see what's going on. But if someone picks them up in their car this morning, I will give you a good idea of their world just by looking at how... At how the state of the inside of their car mm. it will give me a good indication of the inside of their mind within five minutes especially if my proximity is balanced if i have a close proximity to god or a close proximity to myself and um, they will reveal things within the conversation that will tell me exactly where they are and if i'm working with them that will enable me to uh, guide them on how to work so it's always going to be for me um not trying to change the world it's, but it's about trying to reveal my, uh, my authentic self um, by reclaiming all the parts of me that aren't authentic. Um, so, and, and, so is the notion that you, don't, that you don't try to change the world, but that you change yourself in relationship to the world and that yeah. through, through that, the soul evolves towards, yeah. cause, towards higher levels of ascension i guess because otherwise then what's the point right like yeah, absolutely there's no limit to the there's no limit to our, our ability to com- keep to keep improving um and the the, the uh but we're so, improving the, from the level of the soul right from the level of the soul yeah not the and level the of the just, ego or the or the physical no this person. isn't about accum- this isn't about accumulation it's not about accolades this is just about contracting in order to expand and when you, the, the lovely thing I like is that the rewards are not in this world, and I'll explain this, but the, the rewards are in the world to come. Now, when you say that to people, it's like, well, I don't like the sound of that because the world <laughs> right. to come, I've got to, got to die to get there. Right. But that's not, when, when you read the deeper esoteric Judaic texts, for instance, Kabbalah, Zohar, they, the world to come is not the world that happens after we die. The world to come is post-ignorance. So when I'm able to um, disclaim a disbelief, when I'm able to disclaim a belief that's harmful to me, my world will change in the world to come. So when I remove that ignorance, uh-huh. the world to come is post-ignorance because I will expand, and that can continue ad infinitum. Ad infinitum. So each time I reclaim a part of myself, I go into a new realm literally into a new incarnation my world looks different it feels different it sounds different because i am in the world to come i may may be still around people that were in my old frequency 
and they may not sit very well with me and I may not sit very well with them because it's an uncomfortable balance when your frequency is different from theirs. The exciting thing is that the world to come is here and now. Purgatory, Labardo, is here and now. Hell is very real. I could take you to places in Coventry now, which are, you know, are the equivalent to the ninth circle of Dante's Inferno. They are real, um, but they're only perception-based. Um, that you know, they're only uh, they're only based on belief that somebody hasn't questioned. So my job, my job as um, as a guru or as a mystic or as a, or as just as a man that's traveling through this incarnation, my job is to uh, reveal as much as I, ca- as, as I can of my own authentic self by getting rid of the things that aren't authentic. That's the work. And it burns. It's not socks and sandals, like we said. It's not dream catchers. When we talk about burnt sacrifice, or when we talk about animal sacrifice, that's what it's saying. We, we consume the negative parts ourselves, we literally consume them, they are burned up um, and the, uh, the negative part is transcended and the effulgence that's within that is moved over to us. So, so the it's burnt a symbolic... Offering is an ego. It's a sin offering, it's an ego offering. So it, to, in order to repent or return to the center or, or find refuge, we have to offer these burnt sacrifices. So me and you are talking now, um, it's, it's, it's quite late here. I don't know what time it is there, but when we both sit down, I would, I know there is for me, there's a discomfort. It probably is for you, especially if you're doing a lot of this kind of thing. And the discomfort is based on the fact that I am making a burnt sacrifice. I am, I am burning up parts of my egoic self in order to deliver this uh, interview. Um, and, and that's probably the best thing I can do because I am converting the material into the spiritual and I'm doing it for the right reason or for two reasons. One, because some kid is going to be watching who thinks he can't go on and he thinks there's no hope for him and he thinks there's no redemption for him. And I can categorically tell him with certainty that there is. And two, I don't know what I know until I share it with others. That's one of the things I've learned mm. from my own sergeant. I only, I only, I, I will, I will know a, a good, part of it but i won't know everything i know until i share it with others that's the deal when you go and share it with somebody when you go up to bolton in in england and talk to these prisoners i'm going to put you in front of a guy that's going to talk to you for two minutes about eschatology he's going to give you that gift but you're not going to know that until you get there you're not going to want to go there when you go to london to do this talk for these kids everything inside you is going to resist going because you're too busy to go you've got too much on and it's a tiny little thing. There's no profit in this for anybody. But when I go, I, I go and I do my talk and I talk to these kids. Nelson Mandela's bodyguard turns up and does a talk and he tells me what Nelson Mandela had given him to tell me, which is tell your story. I, I was with Nelson, Man, Nelson Mandela's bodyguard. He was in prison with Nelson Mandela. He told me some of the miracles of Nelson Mandela. I wouldn't have got that if I had not made the burnt sacrifice. And the burnt sacrifice was, the resistance in me was to not go was so tremendous. But I went, and that was, that burning was the ego being consumed in the act of delivering this talk. And the reward was I was in front of this magnificent man who said to me, this is what Nelson Mandela told me to tell you. And I also had a message for this guy as well. I had a message for Chris, because I had a message for him and he had a message for me. I wouldn't have got that without the burnt sacrifice. I wouldn't have known what I know unless I'd have turned up and done that. So when there's resistance for me, and there's a strong resistance, I know there's a big reward. But I still have to sit down. I still have to do the talk. I still mm-hmm. have to feel that coursing through me. Mm-hmm. So the world is, um, the, the world is uh, my, I know this. you hear this a lot, but when I say it's my classroom, it, it's literal. It's going right. to keep changing. It's not going to be improved. It isn't going to get better. Your individual world will get better because you are going to go to the world to come beyond ignorance. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm still full of ignorance. There's still lots of things I need to know. So I'm going to continue to expand. I'm going to continue to extract, uh, to, to contract. And I'm going to continue, continue to make kindness my raison d'etre because I understand Dharma. I understand causation. I understand that what I put out there is going to continue to return. I also understand that the world is relying on me 
to be as good as I can be because mm -hmm. all of the problems in the world aren't separate from me. I'm responsible for everything that goes on in the world. At least I, I contribute to it. Mm -hmm. Because if causation is real, it has to be absolute. It isn't partial, it has to be absolute. So if I drop a pebble in the corner of the water here, the ripples are going to meet every part of the pond. Everybody is going to be, fed, be affected by what I think and say and do. So it's a massive responsibility for me to um, work only with the currency of kindness. Well, and so I think about that, too, in terms of like when you talk about a pebble, what I initially talked about was how you're sort of vibrating, right? Like the energy in which you're vibrating in this world is yeah. inherently going to affect every single thing that you touch, think about, yeah. connect with, whatever it is. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Osculation, they call it in mathematics. Osculation means, if you imagine, if you imagine a page full of circles, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and each circle is touching, at the point that each circle touches, it, it's affected. Every, every circle is affected by every, but at the point of touching, they're all, they're all affected by everything else. Like every cell in the body is affected by every other cell because they're all touching at this osculation point. So the world is, you know, I think they call it Indra's web, don't they, in, in Hinduism. The world is connected. It's all connected. So everything we do vibrates out. So even though somebody across the planet might feel disparate from us and nothing to do with us, we're still responsible for their karma with what we do because what we do has a rippling effect on everything. It's a contributing factor to everything. And the only way we can change that is not by... Uh, leaving the problems in our own house and leaving the problems in our own body and going out and trying to save a village in India. It's folly, you know. Um, what we need to do is we need to, we need to get ourselves balanced. We need to bring ourselves home. We need to find refuge or repentance ourselves. That's the one thing we have the ability to do. Mm -hmm. All the other things we think we can do, you know, we think we can bring justice to this person. It's not a human attribute. Justice is a divine attribute. We think we can forgive people. It's not a human attribute. It's a divine attribute. We haven't got the power to do that because there's a law bigger than us. So then how does that work? If, if you as a human can't forgive someone? What you do is you give them over. You may, you may still need to have a conversation with somebody. You may still need your day in court. What you do is you give over the anger, give over the dissonance, give over the pain, you give over all that stuff, and you give over the issue to uh, reciprocity. You give it over to uh, causation. Car to, recognize to karma, the, basically. To right? karma, yeah, yeah, to karma. So karma will level the fields and uh, will, will level the hills and fill the valleys. It will, it, it, will, um, it will settle its own books without our need to witness it. It will do that. We may play our part in it, but it's not us that forgives. We give it over to the greater law. It's not us... Uh, that pardons. We give it over to the greater law. What we have got the power to do, though, is to repent. We get so busy with what everybody else is doing wrong that we don't actually look at the sins we're, we're committing ourselves or the errors we're committing every day. Now, we do have the power to look at that and repent. And, re and repent in Buddhism means uh, to return. In other words, to if we've fallen out of balance and we're missing the target, we return to the middle way. We return to the center. When we return to the center, that is what you would call repentance. But it also means looking at the things we've done wrong. Yes, I was gossiping. Yes, I did assassinate that person's character with my bayonet tweets. I, you know, I may mm -hmm. have hidden it. It may be subtle. Uh, you know, lots of people may have not noticed, but I know myself that I was unkind. And when I did, when I did that, I fell out of balance. So... When I return to balance, of course, I can't just come back to the center. I have to pass all of the things that I did wrong. I have to repent them. So I have to acknowledge them. I have to vow to myself not to do them again. And I have to take responsibility for the consequences of those willingly. It takes a very, very um, astute person, a very awake person, mm -hmm. and a very courageous person to do that. Because as we know, it's very uncomfortable. But once we understand Dharma, once we understand law, which is, you know, the basic law is causation. Once we understand that, we find our repentance in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. In other words, in the teacher, the teaching, and in the community. So you're a teacher to people. You have a teaching, and you've created this wonderful community 
so that people can be in refuge. That's what repentance is. It isn't some biblical um, uh. deity, you know, shaking his fist and looking for vengeance. It's just, uh, it's just a return to what, what they would call in uh, so, uh, psychology homeostasis, mm-hmm. a natural balance. Right. So we're, so we're returning to natural balance. That, so, that's what happens when you wake up. You go, well, I can see I'm, I'm awake, but I'm completely out of balance. So I'm going to bring myself back to balance by breaking my covenant with any negative thing I'm doing. That takes time, obviously. It's a process. So we just have a few minutes left. I mean, I could probably talk to you for like four hours because I feel like there's <laughs> each chapter in your book felt like a book in itself. Like it was so rich with information and detail and description. Um, But what would you say is, you know, you created a a divine covenant. What exactly does that mean? Let's sort of. Right. So when you, you, uh, so when you contract the ego, when you go to work on cleaning the, cleaning the ego out and bring yourself, bring your lower ego under control, you start to connect to the higher soul. So the higher soul descends. As the lower soul rises, the higher soul descends and they meet in the middle. Once you make that connection, uh, uh, you create a covenant. So instead of going through the world with my own will and my own desires and what I want, I start to work from a divine sat So I start to take instruction from vision or from intuition my soul actually mm. becomes my teacher. He will start to communicate. This is very real as well. Um, this, is, this is very, very real. It's, um, so the intuition, you, you have to develop a, an acoustic clarity with the intuition, but it starts to speak to you. And, it, and it's like, a bit like light traveling through water. It automatically calculates the billions of possible routes and offers you the optimum route. Hmm. And that's what, that's what intuition does. So when you have a, when you have a dying... When you, when you are connected to your higher self, <clears throat> when you know who you are, your path through this incarnation and your purpose becomes very clear. <clears throat> and then this higher part of you will direct you and say, go left, go right. Send this person a free book. You know, you need to say no to this person. Push, mm-hmm. yield. You know, mm-hmm. and it will, it will deliver the things you need to do on it. So, okay, we've just had a round of cleaning. We're going to have a honeymoon period where you're going to feel bliss for a bit, but we will come back to the second round of cleaning so that we can reclaim other parts of ourselves. You know, we can take other things out of the plumbing that have been stuck. So it will give you instruction. It might say, you need to go and sit with this person um, because you're still carrying a resentment for him and you need to balance that. Because if, cause if this person is... If, if you can't uh, recompense with this person, then you can't recompense with God. If there's one person standing between you and your, your higher self, then that person is standing between you and God. It's just still another stain on the window. But how, do, how does one differentiate between <clears throat> what their soul is encouraging them or directing them to do versus their ego? Because I know this is uh, a question lots of people often have. Great, yeah, it's a great, that's a great question. Uh, it's a very astute question. Um, in the divine seal, I talk about one of the siddhas, one of the gifts is uh, the divine sword and it's discernment. It's the power of discernment. You start to discern between what is the ego and because uh, the ego is still around. Um, you discern by, between what is the ego and what is the, um, uh, the soul. Um, and that uh, the, the cleaner you become in your life, the, the more small you make your own ambition, the more small you make your own needs, the more small your footprint, the clearer that becomes. I've reduced my life to the point so I don't have to make money. I don't want money to be in my way. I'm not saying money's wrong. I've just reduced it so that nothing can corrupt this voice I hear. My ego isn't going to go, yeah, but we aren't going to make the rent. Yeah, but you know, you wanted that holiday. Yeah, but you was going to get that newer car. And it's okay because everything's spiritual. I get rid of all that because all I want to do is hear the voice of my soul. I want to be instructed to the optimum place. So the, the smaller we can make ourselves, the clearer that voice will become. And then it's just a matter of following the instruction without needing to know where it will go. So it might just say, like for instance, um, some years ago, somebody wrote to me from South Africa and said, would you send me a free book? I'm on hard times. Um, I'm a student. I'll pay you back someday. My intuition 
it doesn't mean I give everything away, but my intuition, I felt something. He just said, send the book, don't think about it. So I said to my wife, send the book, never thought about it again. Ten years later, I go and do this massive podcast. I get invited to do this massive podcast called London Real. You have a million oh, my God, there. yeah. Yeah, like Brian Rose. Yeah. I get, in, I get invited to do this podcast, and I thought, well, it's very high-profile people. I'm not quite, quite sure where they found me. I said, thank you very much. I'll come along. And it was the, the guy that was working with Brian at the time was called Nick. And it was him that I sent the book to 10 years before. Um, so this, this reciprocity took 10 years to turn around. And obviously it was very practical as well because I made, I made tens of thousands of pounds from talks I did and mentoring I did off the basis of one interview. Um, this, is, this is about 10 years ago when I was still busy making money, but the return was massive. Another time, um, I was doing a talk. I was very busy. I was doing a 32-city tour. I was doing a talk in Manchester. I knew I would be introduced to somebody. Uh, I call this divine networking. I knew I would feel it intuitively, but I didn't know who it would be. Turns out it was a young guy called Ben who was working in the store, and he was stacking shelves. But he wanted to be a writer, and my talk had inspired him. And he said, would you take time out? to let me interview you so I can try and sell it as a story. And I was so busy and I could feel the resistance to say, no, I'm, st I'm the busiest man in the world. And I said, I'll meet you next week. I'm in a local town, we'll have an hour. I ended up spending the morning with him, but never thought about it again. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from his sister called Natasha. She said, my brother had been suffering with a bit of depression. So your meeting him really lifted him. She said, look, I'm a TV producer. Would you like to meet and talk about ideas? So to cut a long story short, I got two BAFTA nominations and one BAFTA win from meeting Natasha because we made, uh, we made two films, three films together. And the first one we made was BAFTA nominated. The second one won a BAFTA. And then that went on to be a feature, a feature film. And then that, that led on to me doing a film with Orlando Bloom, which has just been released in America now called Retaliation. But all of that came from, uh, uh, from a kid who on the, per on the surface of it, in the world, in worldly, um, in worldly means, there was no profit at all. But in divine measure, he, he was the most profitable person in the whole world. Because he led me on a tangent that I would never have found if I hadn't have taken that couple of hours out for him. So we, and is we, that we followed not, the instruction. Right. And that is not driven by ego because no. you don't know the <clears throat> result of it versus saying, oh, yeah. I'm going to give it to this guy because I know this guy is connected to that yeah. person who's connected to that person yeah. who's connected to that person who's going to get me a film with Orlando Bloom. <clears throat> yeah. You, right? You, that's the, the ego moment you do that, Yeah, that's ego driven. The moment you do that, that's, that's normal networking. It's what most people do. <clears throat> and most of the time it breaks because everybody understands agenda. The only thing with agenda is that everybody's doing agenda. And the only thing with masks is that everyone's wearing masks. And oh, everybody for sure knows they are wearing, now. Yeah, and everybody knows they're wearing masks as well. So, but when we take our mask off, it makes us very unique. And we're not looking for profit. We're not looking for that. We, what, what might come back for me, Amy, might not come back in my lifetime. I'm not interested in a legacy. I'm not interested in anybody remembering me. It's too small. I want to follow the command of my soul. And the command of my soul will take me to the optimum place. That's something I'm certain about. Certainty is one of the gifts of one of the sitters as well from waking up. And so you trust that you will have whatever you need to support yourself in order to survive. And it's that it's yes. through that trust that yeah. sort of things ma manifest or come to you yeah. or however you want to whatever yeah. terms you want to use, but you're yeah. not focused on I need money to pay my bills. It's I trust yeah. That in doing the work of my soul, I will have whatever it is that I need. Where, whatever I need. It won't, it won't be whatever I want. Right. It will be whatever I need. And, right. and that will come. In, in the Buddhism, they, 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 they use the allegory of, they say you will be given two, two Dharma protectors. You'll have two beings that will follow you and they will look after your means. They will protect you from outside forces, but they will also look after your means. They'll make sure you have supper, they'll make sure you have transport, they'll make sure you have a house. But sometimes what you need doesn't come till the 11th hour. Sometimes it comes from an unexpected place, but it comes. And that's where we have to develop the trust and the faith. And obviously once it's happened a few times, you start to understand that. But you also play your, well, for me personally, I play my role. 
And my role is to give myself as small a footprint as I can so that I, have, I don't have many needs. I don't have many needs at all. I'm trying to get rid of all of those needs so that I can sit down and, I, and it won't matter to me whether I'm doing a project that's a, a love project where there's no money at all, but equally it wouldn't matter to me if it was a 50 million pound film. It doesn't mean I'd refuse the money. I would just do something purposeful with it. Right. But I'm not aiming for money. I'm not aiming for accolades. I'm not interested in it. It's just it's small change. Believe me, I've done all that. It's absolutely small change. I'm interested in the big game. So I take the instruction. I follow the instruction. I don't look for returns. I don't keep count. The moment I keep count, I fall into ego again. So yes, you're absolutely right. You don't, you don't question where it's going to go. You don't think to yourself, well, if I send that book, that's going to, the book's £15 and the postage is going to be £15 to South Africa. Well, you know, that's a bit expensive. It's a bit cheeky. And, you know, you don't go there. If the intuition says send it, you send it. But if anything ego comes in at all, you, you dismiss it. You don't engage it. Remember, reality exists at the level of engagement. Who are we engaging? Wow. My mind is like <laughs> totally blown right now. And I feel like I've got a lot of work to do. Um, thank you so much for your time thank today, you, for this incredible conversation. Um, I, I don't even know. I, I, it was, whoa, it was a lot. I, I'm going to need to take what, what, all of this in. What we've done, what we've done, Amy, is we've, we've created a divine link. And what comes through me and what comes through you is without agenda and it's pure. And that's why we're both feeling this. Whatever it is we're feeling, we're feeling it. And we've disappeared. I don't know. We've fallen out of time. We've fallen into the abstract. We've just disappeared 45 minutes. It feels like we've just sat down. That's, know. When, you know you, that's when you know you're in alignment. Yeah, this was awesome. So if people want to find you, your book is called The Divine CEO. But where can they find, your, where can they find you? Best place to find me is... Uh, uh, Jeff Thompson official on Instagram. So it's Jeff underscore Thompson underscore official. Um, and that's the only place I am. That's the only footprint or the only presence I have personally on, on the internet. There's lots of other things on there about me, but the only place I am currently and my current work is on Instagram. And I have a lovely girl called Gabriella who manages it all for me. She's amazing. So that's where they can find me. Okay, perfect. And I'll have you tagged in my um, show notes and, and when we promote this this episode. So thank you so much for your time. Woo, that was great. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Wondering what comes next and what it all means? Head over to Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your podcasts and hit subscribe. Also, if you could take a minute to rate and review my podcast, I would really appreciate it. Stay tuned as we continue to explore life, death, and the space between.